Welcome to the Mercatus Center's Continuing Legal Education course. Uh, today our course is the Power to Regulate Commerce. Uh, it features a case study of Virginia's challenge to the individual purchase mandate under the recently passed Affordable Care Act. Our faculty today have a wealth of experience and knowledge on this subject to share with you. Our first lecturer is Randy Barnett, who is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches constitutional law and contracts. In 2008, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in Constitutional Studies, and he honed his courtroom skills as a prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney Office in Chicago. Um, he's a much sought after writer and speaker on constitutional issues and has published numerous books, too numerous to mention, and over 100 law review articles, is that? Uh, our second lecturer is Wesley Russell, who serves as Deputy Attorney General for the Civil Litigation Division of Virginia under uh, Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli. The Civil Litigation Division uh, handles most of the civil litigation in the state that involves the Commonwealth, its agencies and employees. In this capacity, Wesley is one of the lead lawyers working on the Commonwealth's challenge to the federal health care law. Um, just some administrative housekeeping details. This course has been approved for CLE credit two credits in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And if anyone would like help applying for other states, just let us know. Just let Robin in the back or myself know, and we'll do what we can to help. Um, and without further ado, we'll get started with Professor Barnett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, one more thing about my background that will be of relevance to this and that I was one of the lawyers that brought the Gonzalez versus Rach lawsuit, the medical marijuana lawsuit, and argued in the Supreme Court. So that, when that case was brought, after that case was lost, six to three, I really thought that there would never be another Commerce Clause, another big Commerce Clause case. And all the things I learned about the Commerce Clause during that litigation were for academic purposes only. But it turns out the government thought of another thing it could do that hadn't done before, and as a result, there is another Commerce Clause case. And I need to um, uh, uh, disclose that I'm now uh, part of the legal team uh, representing the National Federation of Independent Business in their lawsuit in the 11th Circuit. If those of you who don't know, the NFIB is a private party associated with the 26 uh, AG lawsuit that comes out of Florida, and they've been associated with that case from the beginning. And, uh, I'm, one of the I'm part of the legal team now, formerly part of the legal team that's going to be uh, handling the appeal in the 11th Circuit. Um, okay, well, let me just get myself wired here. So let me begin with a thought experiment. Imagine I tell you 100 things that you may not do tomorrow. Uh, for example, you may not run on a treadmill, you may not eat broccoli, you may not buy a car, and 97 other specific things that you may not do. Now, while your liberty would certainly be restricted, there would still be an infinite number of things that you'll still be able to do. Now, suppose I tell you 100 things that you must do tomorrow. You must run on a treadmill. You must eat broccoli. You must buy a car and 97 other things you must do. These 100 mandates could potentially occupy all your time and consume all your money. Now, I use this illustration to help you see why economic mandates are so much more onerous than either economic regulations, which tell you how to do something, or even economic prohibitions, which tell you that you may not do it at all. And therefore, why so dangerous an unwritten constitution, a congressional power should not be implied. In 2010, something happened in this country that has never happened before. Congress required that every person enter into a contractual relationship with a private company. Now, I know that speakers make lots of claims that when you're listening to them, you're wise to be skeptical about. But I can prove to you that economic mandates like this one are unprecedented. Because if this had ever happened before, each one of you would know all the contracts the federal government requires you to make upon penalty of a payment, pain of a penalty payable to the IRS. But None of you can recite any such mandates, and neither could your parents, and neither could your grandparents, because this has never happened before. Now, it's not as though the federal government never makes you do anything. 
You must register for the military and serve if called. You must submit a tax form, fill out a census form, and serve on a jury. And I discovered since I got involved in this litigation that you also have to join a posse if one is being organized by a US Marshal to enforce federal law. But the existence and nature of these very few duties illuminates the truly extraordinary and objectionable nature of the individual insurance mandate. Each of these duties is necessary for the operation of government itself, and each has traditionally been recognized as inherent in being a citizen of the United States. <clears throat> Consider the military draft. In 1918, the Supreme Court rejected the claim that the military draft violated the 13th Amendment, which bars involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime. And the court said that it couldn't see how, quote, the exaction by the government from the citizen of the performance of his supreme and noble duty of contributing to the defense of the rights and honor of the nation can be said to be the imposition of involuntary servitude, unquote. So is it truly part of the supreme and noble duty of citizenship to do whatever Congress deems in its own discretion to be convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce, that really is what's at issue in this case. Because if the mandate is upheld, that will be the proposition that will be sustained. It will be part of the supreme and noble duty of every citizen to, to do whatever Congress deems convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce. In essence, what the mandate's defenders are claiming is that because Congress has the power to draft you into the military and make you fight and die for your country. It has the power to make you do anything less than this, including mandating that you send your money to a private company and do business with it or another like it for the rest of your life. And that does not follow. The greater power does not include the lesser power. Because if it did, essentially, since the greater power is, a, is the power to make you, to conscript you and make you fight and die, if it included all the lesser powers, then the government would have complete and total power over you um, as though it were your master and you were its slave. Now it's true that the government, that the Constitution does give Congress the power to impose taxes on the people to compel them to give their money to the government for its support. And it has long been assumed that Congress can then appropriate funds to provide for the common defense and general welfare by making disbursements to private companies and individuals. Social Security and Medicare are examples of the exercise of this tax and spending power. But when it devised the Affordable Care Act, the Senate declined to adopt a new tax and spending scheme. To date, none of the five district courts who have considered the constitutionality of the mandate, including the three judges who have upheld it as constitutional, have accepted the theory that it is justified under the tax power. And I can, in the Q&A, um, talk more about why it isn't justified under the tax power. The way that we're going to work the format here, the way we decided to do it, is I will talk for about 20 minutes to a half hour, and Wesley will talk about, it took about 20 minutes to a half hour, and then we'll take a break, and then the last hour will just be question and answer, although Wesley said he'll entertain your interruptions and questions if you want to, but that's sort of, we thought we'd front load the talk and we'd back load the discussion. So I'm happy to talk more about the tax power argument then. So instead of doing that, though, what these courts have all done is examine whether the mandate is within the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause to regulate commerce among the several states, which is what the Commerce Clause says, or whether under the Necessary and Proper Clause, the mandate is both necessary and proper for carrying into execution its Commerce Clause power. And I think that if this thing goes to the Supreme Court, as it's very, very likely to do, that's really what the case is going to turn on. It's going to turn on its regulatory powers. It's not going to turn on its tax power. Now, nothing in my talk today, or in any of the lawsuits, uh, turns on whether the mandate is within the original meaning of these enumerated powers. Uh, in my view, they cl it clearly is not. In fact, the whole insurance regulatory scheme would not be within the original meaning of the Commerce Clause. Um, but instead of that, the legal challenges, all the legal challenges, are based entirely on what existing Supreme Court doctrine says about the scope of the Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause. Now, there are three different things you can say, mean when you say, is something constitutional? You could say, is it constitutional 
under the written Constitution based on what the Constitution says. This is the archaic way of asking whether something's constitutional. It's not done very often. Secondly, you could say, is it constitutional based on what the Supreme Court has said? In which case, you have to study what the Supreme Court has said. And the third thing, the third sense of constitutional is, can you count to five votes? Will it be likely be upheld by the Supreme Court in the future? All th three are actually legitimate ways of looking at the term of the meaning of constitutionality. But they're not the same, and it's, very, it's important for us to keep clear which ones we're talking about when we're talking so that we're not talking past each other. So I make an argument around original meaning, and someone else counters with what the Supreme Court says, and a third person says, yes, but what will the court do? Those are three different arguments, three different senses. The legal challenges, are, and my talk today, are based entirely on the second sense. What has the Supreme Court said? What is existing doctrine governing the Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause? Now, of course, given that economic, man and, but in the q and I'm, I'm happy to speculate about <coughs> predictions about the Supreme Court, although I don't really know what the Supreme Court will do. I'll tell you that up front. Now, given that we're talking about what the Supreme Court has said, but also the fact that economic mandates have never before been imposed by the pe on the people by Congress, there can't possibly be any Supreme Court precedent that expressly upholds such a power. That just, that's where we start the reason why these lawsuits have legs. But during the New Deal, as you know, the Supreme Court used the Necessary and Proper Clause to allow Congress to go well beyond the regulation of interstate commerce itself to reach wholly intrastate activities that are not themselves commerce, but which substantially affect interstate commerce. This is the Substantial Effects Doctrine. However, in 1995, in the case of United States versus Lopez, which involved the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which made it a crime to possess a gun within 1,000 feet of a school, uh, the Supreme Court then limited the reach of this power, this implied power, to reach intrastate activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. It limited it to reaching intrastate activities that were economic rather than non-economic. So it provided a doctrinal limit on the scope of the substantial effects doctrine. Barring Congress from regulating non-economic intrastate activity keeps it from reaching activity that has only a remote connection to interstate commerce and is therefore likely to be unnecessary uh, without getting the court into the business of assessing the necessity of this versus the necessity of that, or what or Alexander Hamilton referred to as the more or less necessity or utility of a measure. That is something the court has declined to get into um, uh, for 230 years, and, but what the economic, non-economic distinction does is it allows it to screen things that are likely to be incidental to the regulation of interstate commerce, the regulation of interstate economic activity, from things that are likely to be remote from the regulation of interstate commerce, the regulation of interstate non-economic activity, and remoteness is part of what goes into whether something is necessary or not under the Necessary and Proper Clause. So under existing Commerce Clause, and necessary and proper clause doctrine, that existing doctrine allows Congress to go this far, the regulation of intrastate economic activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce, and no farther, at least so far. The court is always free to let it go farther than it's ever let it go before, but that's where we stand today. However, the individual mandate goes well beyond the regulation of economic activity to literally regulate inactivity, and you've all probably heard about the activity-inactivity debate here, and this is why you have it, because we're trying to interpret this doctrine, which allows the, uh, Congress to regulate economic activity, so now the issue is, what about inactivity? Rather than regulating or prohibiting economic activity in which a citizen voluntarily chooses to engage, Congress commanded that every citizen must engage in economic activity, the activity of doing business with a health insurance company. It's as though, in the case of Wickard versus Filburn, which I will talk about later, the federal government had mandated that Roscoe Filburn grow wheat. Or in the Rach case, the medical marijuana case I mentioned, that, that, that the federal government had mandated that my client, Angel Rach, grow marijuana for medical purposes. Of course, no such power was asserted in those cases. So, to try to stay within existing doctrine, because this is the existing doctrine, the, the government understands that, um, and the existing doctrine only allows the regulation of economic activity, the government has been forced to offer a number of continually shifting arguments for why, despite the appearances, 
insurance mandates are actually regulations of economic activity. And it's the very fact that these doctrines have shifted, I think, is interesting. Because if this really were the slam dunk case that it claimed to be, and if the challenges were as frivolous as they're said to be, the government wouldn't have to continually come up with new theories about what really it's doing to justify what it's doing. It's still trying to figure out what the best theory is to justify what it's doing. Well, let's start with the statute itself. The statute itself speaks of decisions or the activity of decisions as though making a decision is an action. But expanding the meaning of activity to include decisions not to act just erases the distinction between acting and not acting, between activity and non-activity. Uh, it would convert all of your decisions not to sell your stuff, your belongings, into economic activity that could then be regulated or mandated if Congress deems it convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce. In, indeed, in upholding the mandate, Judge Kessler here in the District of Columbia helpfully clarified the unprecedented nature of this uh, power being asserted by the government. So here I'm quoting a judge who upheld the mandate, the most recent judge to uphold the mandate. And you'll see that it really supports the analysis that I'm giving you. Here's what she said. Quote, as previous Commerce Clause cases have all involved physical activity, so that just shows you that this mandate is you know, unprecedented, as opposed to mental activity, helpful, i.e. decision making, more helpful, she then goes on, there is little judicial guidance on whether the latter falls within the Congress's power. Let me just read that to you without my own interruptions. As previous Commerce Clause cases have all involved physical activity as opposed to mental activity, i.e. decision making, there is, a, there is little judicial guidance on whether the latter falls within Congress's power. So that's sort of a confirmation, actually, of the analysis I've given you about the unprecedented nature of this and how there is no binding precedent. OK, so that's how she characterized it. Activity is not limited to physical. It includes mental activity, which includes decision making. Then she then goes on to assert Quote, it is, and this is how she reaches her contrary conclusion, it is pure semantics to argue that an individual who makes a choice to forego health insurance is not acting, especially given the serious economic and health-related consequences to every individual of that choice, unquote. However, just as the economic consequences of gun possession near a school zone, in a school zone, which was the Lopez case, or gender-motivated violence, which was the Morrison case, did not convert those non-economic activities into and make them economic activities. I mean, they had economic consequences. That was what the government claimed. That didn't make them economic activities. Um, the economic consequences of not acting does not make inaction an action. In fact, um, many of you may remember in law school where your torch professor spent a great deal of time uh, 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 questioning the uh, act omission distinction in talking about, for example, duties to rescue. And this is a standard law professor's move. In fact, I think part of the confusion in this case is the employment of the standard law professor's move to, to deconstruct the distinction between acting, killing somebody, and not acting, failing to rescue them, and therefore eroding that distinction. But here's the key. That law professor's argument is based on the consequences of inaction. It basically says, look, if the consequences of inaction are as serious as the consequences of action, then we ought to treat inaction the same way we treat action. That's literally what the argument is. And that's fine. That's a reasonable argument. But it is not an argument that there's no difference between action and action. You would actually literally have to be insane to believe there's no difference. I mean, you, it would, you could probably be committed if you actually believed there was no difference between acting and not acting between punching someone in the nose and not punching them in the nose. So what the law professor's thing that you may remember from law school is about is the consequences of a policy that allows you not to act versus a policy that only holds you liable for your actions. And that's a legitimate argument. But it doesn't collapse the actual distinction. And neither does the economic consequences of not acting or not buying health insurance make that into activity. It doesn't make it, maybe make it into something that you should be regulated or mandated, but it doesn't make it activity. So it doesn't actually erode the distinction itself. It's an argument against making the distinction. But that's an argument against current law, which is so far rest on the regulation of activity. 
So in litigation, the government has also claimed that, in regu that it is regulating the activity of obtaining health care. This is one of its shifting arguments. So now it's regulating not the decision to buy a health insurance, but the activity of getting health care, which it says everyone will eventually seek. And most recently, it has claimed that the minimum coverage provision regulates the practice of obtaining health care services without insurance. Why it shifted to the word practice is a little unclear, but in Lopez, actually, in one sentence, the court does use the word practice. So I think that's what they're picking up on to try to shift away from activity to practice. However, had the Congress tried to condition the activity of delivering or obtaining health care on patients uh, who had previously purchased health insurance, so you can't get health care unless you buy insurance, they've actually made that against the law for hospitals to, to do that. That's the reason why we have this free rider problem, because they have a law, a 1986 law, that says you can't condition health care on having insurance. All right, so, but assuming they try to do that, um, I think they could do that under the Commerce Clause. That is, it would be a regulation of economic activity, but there'd be serious due process clause problems with preventing you from seeking health care to preserve your life by paying for it out of your own pocket or allowing a doctor to provide it for you for free or whatever. I mean, I think that there'd be serious constitutional problems. It just wouldn't necessarily be a Commerce Clause problem. And they didn't try to do that anyway because it would be politically ridiculous to try to say that you can't get health care no matter if you can pay for it or not. So that it didn't try to do that. It did not regulate the activity of obtaining health care. Had it done, and here's the test of whether it had done this or not. Had it done so, you could avoid the duty to buy health insurance by avoiding the activity of obtaining health care. That's, that's the, that's, in fact, that's part of the signal that you're regulating activity is that if you're regulating voluntary activity, you avoid the liability by not engaging in the activity. And you can't not engage in this activity because it makes you buy health insurance whether you get health care, ever get health care or not. And the fact that most Americans will someday seek health care at some point or another, and it's most, it's not all, does not convert their failure to obtain insurance into a form of economic activity. Finally, the government asserts, and this may be the argument that will ultimately be the most important one, because these other arguments by the government, I mean, if, I mean, if Justice Breyer writes the opinion, he, he can write that argument, and he can write all of these arguments, but uh, I think the one that the case will probably more likely turn on is the government's claim that um, it may do anything that it deems to be necessary or essential to its broader regulation of the national economy or the broader, broader regulation of interstate commerce, which in this case would be the regulation of the insurance companies. Um, uh, so one thing to keep in mind is there, that there is no real existing doctrine like this. It, it has a plausibility about it, and in fact, I think the court would recognize this doctrine because it's mentioned in a sentence in Lopez that the Gun-Free School Zone Act was not essential to a broader regula regulation of interstate commerce that could be undercut if it could be reached. It's mentioned in Rage. Uh, but it's not mentioned in Rage that, that it does, it's not said in Rage that you can reach non-economic inactivity. Um, but it's most prominently explained in Justice Scalia's concurring opinion in Rage, in which he refuses to join the majority's conclusion that the production and consumption of marijuana is economic activity, therefore it comes in under the doctrine. And Justice Scalia argues in that case that there is another doctrine under the Necessary and Proper Clause. He says the Substantial Effects Doctrine is a Necessary and Proper Clause doctrine. And then there's another necessary and proper clause doctrine that you can reach even intrastate non-economic activity if doing so is essential to your regulation of interstate commerce. Um, so it, this, this theory most prominently relies on a concurring opinion by one justice, a justice who is on what you might call the right side of the court, and, it, and puts it to eggs in that particular basket. Now, whenever a majority of the court eventually decides to apply that doctrine in a case, the, not the essential to a broader regulatory scheme doctrine. Um, and I think it may very well do so. I think that there's a, every chance to think that this is a doctrine that the court will recognize and will use one day. Whenever it does so, it's going to need to limit that doctrine. There's going to have to be a limit on it, just the way the court in Lopez put a limit on the, uh, on the substantial effects doctrine, said you can only reach wholly interstate economic activity. Why does there have to be a limit? As Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, explained in Lopez, it, without a limit, it would give Congress a plenary police power, and it's sort of a basic matter of first principles that Congress does not have a plenary police power. Its scope of Congress's power is not as broad as the scope of the state power, and therefore there must be a limit on it, or any argument or, that, or theory that would lead to 
the same scope of congressional power that the states have is just not constitutional. It's not a proper, in the words of Judge Vincent in Florida, it's not a proper interpretation of, of federal power, of the scope of federal power. So if ever this non-economic, I'm sorry, whatever, whenever this essential to a broader regulatory scheme uh, theory is recognized by the court, they're going to have to have a limit. Um, I think the most obvious limit, I'm going to talk about what the most obvious limit is maybe later, but I think the most obvious limit is the activity and activity distinction. And it basically says that Congress may reach wholly intrastate non-economic activity if doing so is essential to a broader regulatory scheme, but it may not reach <coughs> not inactivity. And then when the court is figuring out whether it wants to apply that limit, Justice Scalia might remember that in his concurring opinion in Rage, he uses the word activity or activities 42 times in one opinion. So he might remember that, and he might think, well, you know, there's a limit. You can't go inactivity. There you go. There's a limit. Now, the government understands it needs to have a limit, too, uh, because there's this problem. When Drew Days was arguing the Lopez case in the Supreme Court, and he was asked by Justice Scalia, under your theory of the Commerce Clause, what law, cannot, what, what law would Congress be unable to pass? Uh, Solicitor General Days was unable to come up with any examples, uh, which turns out to have been the wrong answer. For, and so the government understands that is the wrong answer, and now it has to have a limit. So what is the limit that it's argued for? Its main argument up till now has been that health care is somehow different than other kinds of goods and services. And you've probably heard this argument. Health care is different. Because everyone will one day need health care and may not be able to afford it. And because emergency rooms are obligated by law to provide care regardless of ability to pay, thanks to Congress, then it is said to be, quote, necessary, unquote, to require that all persons purchase health insurance today to avoid shifting costs to others tomorrow. Or, by the way, it's, you know, it's a pretty reasonable description of the situation that Congress has created. Uh, but even assuming that this empirical claim, this factual claim is accurate, here's the important point. It does not provide a constitutional limitation on the power. It's simply a factual story they're telling. And they haven't identified what about this story creates a limit on congressional power. If the Supreme Court upholds the power to impose insurance mandates on the people in the future, it will never evaluate the next use of economic mandates to see if that circumstance is similar to or different from health care. Why? Because I just told, I told you a while ago, for 230 years, the Supreme Court has denied its power to get into the business of saying, is this more or less necessary? The more or less necessity of something or the more or less utility of something. This is asking, the government is basically asserting, well, this is really necessary. Well, something else might not be really necessary. But the court already knows it's not going to engage in that activity of, judge, of scrutiny. Therefore, if it says it's okay here because it buys the story now, it will have to say it's okay from now on, and therefore there will be no limit. Once the power to conscript Americans to enter into contractual relationships with private companies is accepted here, it will be accepted any time Congress deems economic mandates to be convenient to its regulation of interstate commerce. So whenever defenders of insurance mandates say, well, health care is different, you have to ask them, okay, fine, great. but." What constitutional limitation are you proposing for this power? If at that point their only reply is the protection of liberty in the due process clause, then they are implicitly admitting that the enumerated powers themselves have no enforceable limit. Now, who has made that argument? Charles Freed, when I testified with him in the Senate Judiciary Committee, he made that argument. Walter Dellinger has made that argument. I just debated Charles Freed and Larry Tribe at Harvard Law School. They both made this argument that the limitation is liberty. I mean, Freed says it's only liberty. Larry does not say it's only liberty, but because uh, he knows that it, it yields the problem I'm about to describe if he were to say this. And the problem is this. If you say the only restriction on federal power under the Commerce Clause is liberty in the Due Process Clause, you are then saying that Congress's power is as plenary and as great as the state's police power because the state's police power is only limited by the Due Process Clause, too. So if the only limitation on a power of the federal government is exactly the same as the only limitation on the power of the state government, it means the scope of the federal power is the same as the scope of the state power. And I already told you, that's a constitutional no-no. The idea that the federal government has the same scope of power as the state government has been repeatedly rejected by the Supreme Court, including in the Lopez case itself. OK, so look what's happening here. Congress exercises its commerce power to impose mandates on insurance companies. Under the case of Southeastern Underwriters, it's allowed to do this. 
But it then claims that these insurance company mandates will not have their desired effects unless it can impose mandates on the people, and that's why it's necessary. By this reasoning, Congress can prohibit, regulate, or mandate any activity it decides it wants to simply by adopting a broad regulatory scheme that won't work the way it wishes unless a mandate on something else, in this case it's private conduct, is uh, imposed. Now, what's the textual flaw of that reasoning? There actually is a textual flaw. It looks a little esoteric, but I think that's what sometimes happens when you get down to the weeds like this. The esoteric flaw in the argument is that unlike restrictions, for example, on the intrastate production of wheat in Wickard or marijuana in Raich, the individual insurance mandate is not actually necessary for carrying into execution Congress's power to regulate the insurance companies. Those laws can be perfectly well carried into execution. That's not a problem. Instead, what it's necessary for is to ameliorate the effects of successfully executing the regulations on the insurance companies. It really was necessary to get to Roscoe Filburn's wheat to execute the law that, of the quota system and restrict the supply of wheat, which was the intention of the law. And it really was necessary in some respects, or it could be thought to be necessary to regulate intrastate medical marijuana in order to actually restrict the flow of interstate marijuana. But this isn't necessary to impose. The insurance companies will go along. I mean, they, they, if you can enforce that law, but there's going to be consequences. People are not going to do business with the insurance companies because they don't have to buy insurance until they get sick. That's an effect of the law. That's not an execution of the law. And that's the textual problem with using the necessary and proper clause in this way. It is not consistent with what John Marshall referred to in McCulloch versus Maryland as the letter and spirit of the Constitution. And therefore, it is an improper reading of the necessary and proper clause, which is what Justice, uh, uh, was what Judge Vincent said in Florida. So now, are there five votes? This is the, the fifth sense of constitutionality, the prediction sense. This is my final paragraph. Are there five votes in the Supreme Court to extend Congress's power to include the imposition of economic mandates? We'll talk more about this after the break. Well, because Congress has never done anything like this before, it turns out Congre if, if the court does prohibit Congress from using economic mandates, it only has to strike down one law that's ever been passed in the history of the United States, and that is the Affordable Care Act of 2010. And that makes challenges to the Affordable Care Act more likely to succeed. The Congress is very reluctant to make a ruling. Went, uh, I, the, the New York Times did an editorial against me, actually. Uh, it's kind of an honor to be the subject of a New York Times editorial. It was, an, it was an against my Senate testimony. And it said that if Professor Barnett had his way, then it would undo all of these other legislations. The very radical theory would undo everything. Well, this is just a compl I, I had a letter. They actually also published my letter to the editor saying this is just not accurate. There's only one law that would be affected if my arguments ex if accepted, and that is this law, because it's the only time Congress has ever done it before. So it doesn't undo anything, and that makes it more likely that a justice will be open to um, a valid constitutional objection against it. What, is, what else would make it more likely that a, judge would, a justice would do that? And that is if the law remains as unpopular it is, as it is today. I think they'll be receptive to a valid constitutional argument. It's not to say that they'll strike it down because it's unpopular, but if it's popular, They'll bend over backwards to uphold it. And if it's unpopular, but if it's unpopular, they'll be open to the kind of arguments I've made to you today, which are legal arguments based on the doctrine that currently exists. Um, and the legal argument I think they'll accept is the difference between activity and inactivity. The distinction between acting and not acting is pervasive in all of law. It's pervasive in human life. We are liable for our actions, but absent some, some pre-existing duty, we cannot be penalized for our inaction. There is no supreme and noble duty of, the United, of citizenship to enter into contracts with private companies when ordered by Congress to do so. For this reason, I believe the power to impose economic mandates on the people is simply not within the limited and enumerated powers of Congress. Thanks. Obviously, there'll be a little bit of overlap because, well, we're talking essentially about the same subject. And although we differ probably in some very minute things that we won't share with you, <laughs> uh, given that both of us are uh, in the various circuit courts of appeals right now, um, 
we, uh, we, we generally agree. Um, one of the things that Robin and the folks at Mercatus asked me to specifically concentrate on is rather than the uh, kind of grand overview of constitutional law, which uh, <coughs> Professor Barnett is, is more qualified to give you than I am, to focus on kind of the thought process and the decisions that go into um, actually litigating one of these challenges because as um, you may have guessed this is uh, I think fair to say the largest case I've ever been involved litigating and quite frankly if I continue litigating for a couple hundred years I'm confident it still will be. Um, and it, 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 it was daunting at the start and I'm going to well, first, as Professor Barnett said, I, I welcome questions as I'm going. I'm not a law school professor. I don't lecture to folks. I, I'm, a, I'm a courtroom lawyer or an appellate lawyer, on depending which day of the week it is. I'm used to getting questions, including hostile ones. The only difference is there's no light system up here, so I can talk as long as I want. Um, you know, at the beginning of this, um, and, and I've heard uh, Professor Barnett tell the story, so I, 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 may dra I may mandate that he tell it now is uh, there was a lot of people who thought that any court challenge was frivolous. And I, I believe it was at the um, AALS, the, the law uh, professors uh, guild meeting, essentially, that uh, in 2010, Professor Barnett basically surveyed the group to see who thought they were, the, any challenges were frivolous, and pretty much the whole room thought they were. He asked the question again this year, and what was the result? Well, actually, what it was just, I asked it this year only, and I said, when this thing got started, how many thought it was frivolous? And they all raised their hand. I said, now, how many people think it's frivolous? And a third of the people raised their hand. So, uh, we've got at least two thirds of the people to think we're not just insane, so <laughs> that's something. <laughs> um, Virginia's challenge and is, is, is really, and it's, it's hard for people to grasp, but this is what it is, it's modest and focused. Now, granted, this is one of the larger enactments, um, certainly in my lifetime, or uh, that Congress has passed, but the Virginia challenge is truly modest, and it's modest in this way. We do not seek to overturn any prior decision of the Supreme Court. We take them all as they come. Um, regardless of what one thinks of Wickard versus Filburn or Gonzalez versus Reich, for our purposes, they are correctly decided. And quite frankly, that's a necessity if you are litigating cases in the lower federal courts. Uh, district court judges do not get paid to tell the Supreme Court they are wrong. Um, and so we went with a narrow rifle shot approach that defined the case to a very limited issue, whether the mandate and penalty were within Congress's enumerated powers. Our responsibility is to win the case and not to change anything about the grand landscape of constitutional law. Whether that's a side effect of winning the case, that would be fine with us, but our goal is just to win the case. And as Professor Barnett has very well explained, you can do that without changing anything. Um, Virginia's case started really with uh, a statute that Virginia passed called the Virginia Healthcare Freedom Act, which provides that no one may require any citizen of the Commonwealth to uh, purchase health insurance. And although it is often misrepresented in both filings by the government, the federal government and in the media, as a nullification statute, it is nothing of the kind. It is an exercise of Virginia's police powers, which... Okay. As long as the building's not on fire, I'm fine. Um, which, as we will discuss and have discussed, um, the police powers are reserved to the states and it applies to everyone. The federal government claims it only applies to them. Well, no, Virginia is a Dillon's Rule state. No locality in Virginia can require anybody to have health insurance. No employer in Virginia, with the exception of universities enrolling students, can impose a mandate to purchase health insurance on anyone in Virginia. And so it's not a nullification statute. It is an assertion of Virginia's police powers. Now, it is in conflict with the Federal Act, but I will note that ours passed first. So, and in fact, it passed the Virginia legislature at the time, in fact, still is, was divided uh, with the Democrats controlling one house and the Republicans controlling the other. It passed the Virginia House of Delegates 90 to 3, and in fact, the three votes against it were all cast by Republican legislators who didn't think it went far enough. 
and it passed the Virginia Senate 25 to 15. So this is not some cooked up way to get into federal court. This is an actual enactment of the oldest continuously serving deliberative body in the free world. I think that's right, the Virginia, the Virginia General Assembly. Um, and because there's a conflict between the statutes, as Judge Hudson recognized in, in his opinion in, on the motion to dismiss in our case in Richmond, the mere existence of the lawfully enacted statute is sufficient to trigger the duty of the Attorney General of Virginia to defend the law and the associated sovereign power to enact it. But there is no question that it is in conflict with the, the federal law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or as I like to call it, PACA, because you know, when you're writing a brief late at night and you're looking for anything that seems funny, going into an Elmer Fudd type voice and saying, be very, very quiet, we hunting for PACAs, it's funny to me, I don't know. Um, but it comes down to the Supremacy Clause versus the Tenth Amendment. Um, and people try to shoehorn the case. Well, obviously the federal government wins. There's the Supremacy Clause. And people on the other side say, right, this is clearly an exercise of state prerogatives of the Tenth Amendment. Well, here's the little secret. Neither of those provides a rule of decision for anything. And in fact, they're flip sides of the same coin. The Supremacy Clause actually provides that this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and some other things shall be the supreme law of the land. The Supremacy Clause tells us that laws made in pursuance of the Constitution are the supreme law of the land. It does not tell us if something is made in pursuance of the Constitution. And Justice Kennedy, writing for the court in Alden versus Maine, noted, as it is evident from its text, however, the Supremacy Clause enshrines, quote, as the supreme law of the land, only those federal acts that accord with the constitutional design. Appeal to the supremacy clause alone merely raises the question whether a law is va a valid exercise of national power. So basically, it's just a question. Well, the same thing basically goes for the Tenth Amendment. As the court has said on numerous times, the Tenth Amendment states but a truism. The powers not delegated to the federal government at the time of the founding remain with the states. It doesn't tell you whether a power has or has not been delegated. It just says, if it wasn't, it's the states. So basically, they're the flip sides of the same coin. Well, given that, how do we get where we are? Well, to go over some of the facts specific to the Virginia case, the first thing you need to know is the injury that Virginia has alleged. And this is very important. Um, Virginia has not argued that it is doing this for the benefit of its citizens, although, once again, you know, there are side benefits to things. The reason Virginia brought its challenge is the Virginia General Assembly, the legislative branch of what is supposed to be a co-equal sovereign in the federal system, made a choice, used its sovereign power to enact a code of laws related to a matter of health, safety, and welfare, areas traditionally reserved to the states. And the federal government has sought essentially to invalidate that action. And so the injury that Virginia ha has suffered or the injury that we alleged in the district court and the district court found that we had suffered was that the uh, federal enactment effectively um, divested Virginia of its sovereign ability to create a code of laws that was within its sphere of influence. And this becomes very important because one of the challenges that the federal government has raised and continues to raise regarding it is the concept of does Virginia even have standing? Um, they make this argument a, a couple of ways and I think it's important to note that apparently they don't think we write very well or at least they don't bother to read it. Um, they continue to assert that Virginia is asserting a parents patriot claim that we are st stepping in for the poor citizens of Virginia and saying, you can't do this. We're, we're, we're picking up the fight on their behalf. Um, we have repeatedly, both in brief and oral argument, said we are not making a parents patriae claim. If we were, we would lose. Uh, the United States Supreme Court's case in Massachusetts versus Mellon has, makes it crystal clear that states may not bring a parents patriae claim against the federal government because you can't bring a parent's patriotic claim on behalf of your citizens if they're also citizens of the federal government. Doesn't work. Um, and so we have never argued that we were making a parent's patriotic claim. Once again, our injury is the sovereign injury, that Virginia as a sovereign has a right to enact this 
legislation. And of course, you know, that's one of the truly incredible things about the argument uh, regarding standing. The federal government consistently maintains that, well, all they did was enact a statute. As if enacting a statute in a bicameral legislature that's divided between the political parties is A, something very easy to do, you just snap your fingers and it happens, and B, that it's a low trick of some kind. You know. uh, the standing that Virginia asserts, the sovereign standing, has been recognized consistently by both the United States Supreme Court and the various courts of appeals. In the case of Snap and Sons uh, versus Puerto Rico, uh, the Supreme Court noted that two co core sovereign interests remain with the states. Well, two, two core sovereign interests remaining with the states, quote, are easily identified. First, the exercise of sovereign power over individuals and entities within the relevant jurisdiction. This involves the power to create and enforce a legal code, both civil and criminal. And the court went on to note that that particular power is regularly at issue in constitutional litigation. Well, that kind of sounds like what we have here. Um, later, uh, in a case of Diamond versus Charles, which actually you know, we cited it in our brief, I guess we filed in May of last year, and you know, nobody would comment on it. All the law blogs and just ignore the concept of, no one cited Diamond versus Charles. And then Judge Walker in the Proposition 8 case in California cited it saying that he didn't believe that the proponents of uh, Proposition 8 in California had standing because of Diamond versus Charles because only a state has the right to defend its code of laws. And what the court said in Diamond was, the power to create and enforce a legal code, both civil and criminal, is one of the quintessential functions of a state. Because the state alone is entitled to create a legal code, only the state has the kind of direct stake identified in Sierra Club versus Morton in defending the standards embodied in that code. So if, according to the United States Supreme Court, if a state is defending its own enactment, it even has the stand, it passes all the modern standing tests, Sierra Club versus Morton, the environmental injury test, you know, I go to that creek, I want it to be clean, I want to enjoy it, all of those cases from law school. We have that according to the United States Supreme Court, but the Justice Department, in all of our briefing in the district court, uh, in all of the briefing in the district court, in the 45 minute direct argument at the hearing, and in their opening brief in the Fourth Circuit, do not cite Diamond versus Charles. Don't attempt to distinguish it. Don't do anything with it. They ignore it. Now, I just read you the quote. It's good law. You can jeopardize it. You can check me on it. At the very least, they need to, they need to deal with it. And when we get to the Commerce Clause cases, we deal with the cases that they say are dispositive. On our issues, they just tend to ignore them. Uh, once again, kind of like the shifting theory, most of the time in litigation you would consider that a hint as to which side has the better of the argument. Um, the other argument is that Virginia suffers no harm from the individual mandate simply because Virginia will never be required to buy insurance. And it doesn't have to pay a penalty if it doesn't do so. Because, well, it's not a person. True enough, but once again, the injury is the injury to Virginia's sovereignty. You have removed an area that Virginia has a right to legislate in. And so by not recognizing that there's a sovereign injury that Virginia has suffered, they continue to say there's no injury. I guess if, you, if they actually address Diamond versus Charles, they'd have to acknowledge that maybe there is a sovereign injury. And that you know, basically you can't just say, well, all they did was pass a statute. Well, there's a, as you people know more than most, there's a lot to passing any piece of legislation, especially in a bicameral legislature, especially when one house is controlled by one of the political parties and the other one is controlled by the other. Another argument that they raised in the district court was uh, the concept of ripeness, um, that the mandate doesn't go into effect until 2014, and therefore there is no reason for any court to deal with it until then. Um, I didn't find it very persuasive. Judge Hudson didn't find it very persuasive, and apparently uh, the people handling the appeal at the Justice Department didn't find it very persuasive because they've abandoned it in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, the, another argument they raised was the Anti-Injunction Act, which is kind of tied to their tax argument, 
Um, no federal district court is empowered to enjoin um, the collection of taxes. Uh, the taxpayer has a, the regime would require a taxpayer to pay the tax and then sue later for a refund in the tax court. Um, we made a couple of arguments about that. One, it's not a tax, and we will talk about that more later. And uh, Professor Barnett has indicated he'll talk about it in the Q and A as well. Um, and the other was that there was a case called South Carolina versus Regan that basically says, if a party is being subjected to this government exaction or is suffering injury because of a government exaction, but they're not the one that will ever have to pay it, so they can never pay it and sue, but they're still being injured by it, they can bring suit. And in fact, in that case, it was the state of South Carolina regarding uh, a tax ruling for some tax-exempt bonds. Um, and it's a very narrow exception, but I was like, wait a minute, we have it. We're a state, we're not paying it, and you're telling us our only remedy is to pay it in sue. And Judge Hudson uh, found that we fit squarely within the South Carolina versus Regan exception. And apparently the appellate lawyers at the Justice Department agree because, well, they abandoned that one as well. Uh, there was one other argument they made in the district court as to whether Secretary Geithner was a necessary party. Um, I don't want to get into the vagaries of Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 19A and Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 19B. Needless to say, we maintain that he wasn't a necessary party, and if it was, the government had waived it. Um, the Supreme Court has never decided waiver, wh whether you waive the right to join a necessary party under 19B. Uh, the Circuit Courts of Appeals tend to hold that you can, and uh, the Ninth Circuit case was written by a guy named Anthony Kennedy, so we liked our chances if that, if that argument went up. Um, but uh, once again, uh, the Justice Department on Appeal has decided not to pursue that argument. They're really just making the standing claim that we have suffered no injury, but once again, they don't even cite Diamond versus Charles in their uh, opening brief. And then the constitutional merits, the, constitu the Commerce Clause claim and the tax claim. Um, and Professor Barnett's done a good job of explaining kind of the different ways of viewing it, that something's constitutional. Um, in his book, Active Liberty, Justice Breyer lists um, four things that he says that all judges consider and everybody agrees is an appropriate way to go about doing the judicial function and that two that are not. In the, categor in the category of the four things that everybody is supposed to consider and everybody agrees you consider, I want to focus on three of those. Text, history, precedent. Um, we have engaged in this case both in the District Court and the Fourth Circuit on those three grounds. The Justice Department refuses to talk about either text or history. They only engage us on precedent. Um, we're fine with that because we think we win the fight on precedent as well, and I'll get to some of the reasons why. Because I'm not, because I'm not using it, I don't remember. <laughs> the last is policy. The, the, t the two kind of controversial ones are policy and overriding purpose and basically does it lead to good results? And he concedes that there are a lot of judges who think that those two are none of, not part of the judicial function. He, however, believes it does. It is. Um, history. It is unfathomable that the people who wrote the United States Constitution believed that the government could mandate you engage in a private transaction uh, with another private party. In the Declaration and Resolves of the First Continental Congress of October 14, 1774, the Continental Congress wrote, and I, I love the language, quote, uh, the delegates, quote, cheerfully consented to the operation of such acts of the British Parliament as are bona fide, restrained for the regulation of our external commerce for the purpose of securing the commercial advantages of the whole empire to the mother country and the commercial benefits of its respective members. So, recognized that the Crown had the ability to regulate commerce. In the same document, three pages later, they all note the non-consumption, non-importation agreements that they were going to engage in. We were not going to buy the tea so long as it's taxed. Under this theory, uh, under this theory that the government 
with its power to regulate commerce, can force you to enter into a private transaction, the Crown could have solved all of its colonial problems by just ordering the citizens to buy the tea. When the non-importation and non-consumption agreements, which spread throughout the colonies, took hold, the royal governors and parliament took up the issue of whether it was treason to engage in non-consumption and non-importation. Can you really avoid the tax by refusing to engage in the transaction, or is that treason against the crown? The Solicitor General for, for Great Britain, who served in, uh, uh, it, by tradition served in the House of Commons, was asked that question, and he, he noted, according, at least according to George Bancroft, I wasn't there, I'm relying on Bancroft's history of the United States, that uh, the colonists were well advised on matters of law and that they were well within their rights to refuse. Um, the uh, royal governor of Massachusetts, uh, Governor Hutchinson, sought all of the constabulary to go break up the meetings about non-consumption, and all of his officers said, sorry, they're within their rights to do this. So, it is unfathomable that from an, any type of originalist analysis that the same people who had just engaged in the non-consumption, non-importation agreements, believed that the government, in the guise of regulating commerce, can force you to buy a good or service from another private citizen. Um, uh, really, uh, any doubt about that, one of the earliest cases of the Supreme Court, Calder versus Bull, Justice Chase is going through his analysis and gets to the end and says, notes that you have to, the Congress has to act within its sphere. There are laws that just don't fit within the constitutional design, and he gives a list of examples, and one is a law that would require citizen A to give his money to citizen B would never be permissible because it flies in the face of the Constitution, both its text and our experience in getting here. Well, what is this if not a law that forces citizen A to pay money to citizen B or be subject to a government fine? Um, the assertion of congressional power is ahistorical. Professor Burnett has done an excellent job of telling you why it is unprecedented and how you know this because you've never had a contract that the Congress forced you to go enter into as a condition of being alive in the United States. Another way we know that it is completely ahistorical is, well, the Justice Department in at least six different suits has, five different suits has reached the merits. Judge Hudson noted in his opinion that we essentially dared them to come up with one example where the commerce power had ever been used in this fashion before. They still haven't come up with one. I'm guessing they've got enough people over there. If there's one, they'd have found it. Um, on top of that, you don't have to take Professor Barnett's word. You don't have to take Virginia's word. You don't have to take the fact that the Justice Department hasn't been able to come up with such an example. The question of whether the mandate had any historical precedent and, was, and or was constitutional has been asked to the Congressional Budget Office once and the Congressional Research Service once. In 1994, the Congressional Budget Office opined that um, the constitutionality of it would be highly questionable because never had Congress required a citizen as a condition of living in the United States to purchase a good or service. In 2009, uh, the Congressional Research Service, in response to a question from the Senate Finance Committee, noted that at best it was an open question because it had never happened before. And there was no clear direction one way or the other. So this is truly something that has never happened before, and nobody disputes that. Except apparently the New York Times editorial board, but you, you set them straight. <laughs> What's the significance of that? Well, as Professor Barnett has pointed out, well, there's no one who can say, hey, look at this case, this controls. And in fact, on the question of whether this is a question of first impression, the Justice Department, in their filing in the Fourth Circuit, you have to fill out a docket sheet, and there's a blank. Is this a question of first impression? They checked yes. That's a little bit different than some of the press statements you read, but they agree. It's a question of first impression. And the, the significance of it being totally unprecedented is, you know, my friends in law enforcement would call this a clue. If Congress has never asserted a power in over 200 years, 
not being a group of people known for being shy about asserting their power, that's probably a hint they don't have the power in the first place. Now, that seems like a, a neat little thing for a lawyer to say, but justices of the United States Supreme Court have said the same thing. Just this past term, last June, in the Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Account Co Company Accounting Oversight Board, basically the Sarbanes-Oxley bill and the double appointment issue to the PCAOB, uh, Justice Roberts for the court, court noted he was quoting uh, at length from Judge Kavanaugh's dissent in the D.C. Circuit and regarding this very issue. He said, perhaps the most telling indication of the severe constitutional problem with the PCAOB is the lack of historical precedent for this entity. Neither the majority opinion nor the PCAOB nor the United States as intervener has located any historical analog for this novel structure. They have not identified any independent agency other than the PCAOB that is appointed by and removable only for cause by another independent agency. And of course the court went on to find that that structure was unconstitutional. But Justice Roberts is not the only current justice who holds that opinion or at least has written that. Um, Justice Kennedy in Prince noted that the fact that Congress had not asserted a particular power or practice for more than 200 years, quote, tends to negate the existence of the congressional power asserted here. Now, in their one foray into finally engaging us on history, the uh, Justice Department in its Fourth Circuit filing notes that around 1820, I believe, Justice Story in one of his commentaries wrote that the mere fact that Congress had never done something before didn't mean it was automatically unconstitutional. And by the way, I agree with that. But of course, the, you know, 40 years into the experiment is one thing, as both of these court cases noted, 220 years into the experiment with no assertion of the power is something different altogether. It's not dispositive, but as I said, law enforcement would call this a clue. Um, the Supreme Court and the Commerce Clause, the precedent, and Professor Burnett's talked about this a lot, and so I'm going to try to make it short, but I'm a lawyer and there's no light, so. Uh, in Lopez, the court recognized that the Commerce Clause regulation reached, up to that point in time, reached three things the use of the channels of interstate commerce, you know, railroads, shipping, that type of thing, to the instrumentalities of interstate commerce, trucks, ships, that type of thing, and three, activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. There is no dispute by anyone that the first two categories aren't what this case is about. We are in the third category activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. And as Professor Barnett noted, and this is a key point, and we make it over and over again, activities that substantially affect interstate commerce is not just the Commerce Clause. That is the Commerce Clause on steroids. It is the Commerce Clause already augmented by the Necessary and Proper Clause. That's as far as it goes, is our, is our position. Um, and back to the Activity in, activity distinction. Did you notice the word that led Clause 3? Activities. Now we hear people all the time say, the word activity appears nowhere in the Commerce Clause. And I'm like, if you want to go just on what the Commerce Clause actually says, I'm willing to do that. But then, then, then the New York Times is right. You've got to roll back lots of stuff. The Supreme Court has always used the phrase activity when it's dealing with regulation. Why? Because the Commerce Clause text begins with a concept to regulate. Regulation assumes activity. There is to regulate commerce. Commerce is a voluntary series of transactions. It's traffic. It is barter. That, that's the language of uh, Latin to English dictionaries translating commercium from the 1750s and 60s. And I'll get to why Virginia gets to be cool at times, at least for law geeks. Um, that is the language of Gibbons versus Ogden, the first Commerce Clause case. I mean, Justice Marshall, having been educated in Virginia in the 1750s and 1760s, looking at Latin and English dictionaries as he learned the law from George With, that is what commerce meant. You don't create a transaction for the purpose of regulating it. You regulate transactions as they already exist. And you know, 
In our historical analysis, we walked through all of that. And so one of the things the Solicitor General of Virginia did, he decided that he would go over to the special collections at the Library of Virginia and pull all Latin English dictionaries they had from the period of 1750 to 1781, figuring one of the founding, th this would be what the founding fathers would have looked at. And he brought them back. I mean, he, 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 he got the definitions down and brought back the various things so we could fill in the sites. He said, look at this, look at this. And, I, and I'm looking at one, and I go, is this a joke? And he says, what do you mean? I said, did you see what's inscribed on the front cover, inside front cover of this Latin English dictionary? He said, no. It's the autograph P. Henry, and then his grandson P. Henry Fontaine. Um, so our supposition that founding fathers would have looked at similar dictionaries has been fairly well proven. And with all respect to the, to the great state of Colorado, the cool thing about being a lawyer and a constitutional challenges in Virginia regarding stuff from the founding period is we still got the stuff. <laughs> I have a question. Um, where in, is this going to be in your briefs, Commercium? The Latin, this, what this research about the Latin meaning of Commercium? It has been and likely, and actually I, we filed the Fourth Circuit brief on um, Monday, and it is in there, I believe. And it was, it was in our district court filing what as well. What was the definition again of commercial? Uh, the, it was to track. Commercium translated to traffic, barter, two or three other things. If I had the brief in front of me, I'd give you the, the full quote. But it was, it was clearly voluntary action. And then the, the, the great thing is in Gibbons versus Ogden, uh, traffic, barter, and intercourse. That's right. I, how, I couldn't remember the one that you know, we could now make dirty. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in Gibbons versus Ogden, when uh, Justice Marshall is talking about the scope of what is meant by commerce, he says traffic and intercourse. I, I'm not claiming he had Patrick Henry's dictionary, but he probably had one from the same set. Um, so we get to the four Commerce Clause cases. Wickard versus Filburn, the Wheat case, Lopez, the Gun-Free School Zone case, Morrison, and Gonzalez versus Raich. And I will try to say nothing about Gonzalez versus Raich because you have somebody who lived it and knows it far better than I do sitting to my right. Wickard and Gonzalez, the way we've argued the case and the way we framed it, because we don't duck cases that the other side say, say cause us a problem. We deal with them. Wickard and Gonzalez represent the affirmative outer limit of the Commerce Clause power. They are as far as Congress is permitted to go. Lopez and Morrison represent the negative outer limit. Stop sign. You've gone too far. And the individual mandate and penalty are beyond the negative outer limit because the assertion of the power to force a citizen to buy a good or service from another citizen has no valid limiting principle, just as Professor Barnard <laughs> said. There is a quote in, in the majority opinion in Morrison that I believe that the Justice Department noted at one point that in a brief we quoted eight times. And in our reply brief we noted and we will quote it eight more until you actually answer the question. And it, 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 going back to your law school days, why is it important to read concurrences? The quote actually originates in Justice Thomas's concurrence in Lopez. But Justice Rehnquist got it part of the majority holding in Morrison five years later. And the quote is this, and the we here is the Supreme Court of the United States. We always have rejected readings of the Commerce Clause and the scope of federal power that would permit Congress to exercise a police power. And so if there's no limit to this, if this effectively allows Congress to have the same plenary power that the states are left with, the court has always rejected such arguments. Um, one of uh, Professor Barnett's colleagues on the Volant Conspiracy, uh, David Bernstein from George Mason, had a post where he noted that this is ultimately where the case will be decided in his opinion, that if the person arguing for the, if the Solicitor General of the United States, assuming he argues the case if in the United States Supreme Court, is arguing this case and hasn't come up with a limiting principle when the white light comes on the podium in the Supreme Court, he doesn't, Professor Bernstein doesn't believe there are five votes for the government's position. 
I, d I don't do predictions while cases are still going on. So, but I thought that was an interesting one. You can find it at the Volokh Conspiracy in the archives. That's a block. <laughs> a block for those of you who don't know what the Volokh Conspiracy is. Kind of an odd name for something. If you don't know what it is, it's a law block that's that's named after Eugene Volokh, uh, his law professor at UCLA, who started it. I, I figured our percentage of law geeks, given that they came to hear you and me, had to be pretty high. <laughs> Um, the Secretary argues essentially two things in response. And the first is the activity and activity distinction. And, you know, we get to this, is an economic decision to buy or not buy something, that's commerce. That's, that's the core of the argument. Well, taking that to its logical conclusion, the decision not to sell something would also be commerce. I mean, does anybody see any way that can't, if the first statement is true, the second one isn't? Buying and selling are the ends of the transaction. And so I pose this hypothetical to you. I want you to assume a man named Lopez, we'll call him Lopez. And let's assume he had a gun. And let's assume he was walking within a thousand feet of the school. But that morning, he went to his computer and looked and there was eBay. And he could have sold his gun. But he elected not to. He continued to, see if you don't sell something, you possess it. If an economic decision the decision to, bu to buy or not to buy, to sell or not to sell, is activity that is regulable under the Commerce Clause, Lopez has incorrectly decided. He made a decision not to sell that gun. He still owned it. And the other is this concept that the healthcare market is unique because everybody will need it at some point. Now, granted, the law contains specific exemptions for people that they concede will never use it, so everybody needs it, not so much. But let's think about some other things that everybody needs. Food, <laughs> clothing, transportation, shelter, energy. Are all of these things, they can mandate you purchase all of these things because everybody's going to use them at some point. We need to make the market what it is. And what's scary about that is those are all the necessities of life. Those are the things that are needed for health, safety, and welfare. You know, the stuff that the states control with their police powers, or at least have up until now. And it's, it's, it's truly frightening when somebody asserting the state police power um, argument cites Alexander Hamilton. Now, we cite founding fathers all the time. We like the dictionary and all that stuff. It's, it's cute. But as you all know, the founding father least likely to say that the states had a particular power was Alexander Hamilton. He was the biggest proponent of a strong and robust federal government. At the ratifying convention for the Constitution in New York, he spoke and he noted that the Constitution did not permit the federal government to invade all, quote, all the recesses of domestic life and that if it did, it would be worthy of rejection. Next is the uh, necessary and proper clause. Well, actually, they, they, in the Fourth Circuit briefing, uh, their, their uh, brief was filed a month ago, they have come up with a new way this is unique. Because, of course, the other problem they have is they're saying that when they've gone to the, the backup argument that we're regulating your purchase of health care services, there's an easy response to that. No, you're not. I'm not buying health care services. I'm sitting on my couch not buying health care services and not buying insurance. But you still tell me I have to go do it. So they go, well, you're going to. Why is, you know, Congress can regulate, the federal government can regulate lots of things if I'm actually engaged in them that I might one day own a nuclear power plant that would be subject to inspections does not subject me to inspections now. I actually have to own the nuclear power plant. And so the new argument that they've come up is to regulate at the point of service, which we, we, we concede they can do. And we concede that if they wanted to actually raise taxes and things like that, they could. To regulate at the point of service would be immoral. And they noted that's why Congress passed EMTALA, the law that forces any hospital in the United States that receives federal funding, which means everything, well, 
receives Medicaid funding, excuse me, which eliminates two hospital systems as best I can tell, the Shriners and the VA, ironically enough. That they have to treat people. Well, see, this is the free rider problem. This is the market distortion. You know, they say, we, we've got to get rid of, we've got to make sure people pay for their medical bills. Well, you're telling people that even if they can't pay, they have to treat them, which is fine, but Congress is the one who did that. That's not a state of nature. You chose to make that problem, if it is a problem. And then the other is, you know, you still allow them to bankrupt their med medical expenses. That seems inconsistent with, I want the person who received the services to actually pay for it. But so Congress creates this market distortion and then says, we have to have this great new scheme to regulate it, and if you have to extend the Constitution a little bit, that's okay. Well, see, that's, that's, that's wrong if you've read Article 5. If you want to change congressional power, the scope of what Congress can do, what the Constitution allows, you amend the Constitution. You don't pass a piece of legislation and have the President sign it. They're effectively arguing that by passing EMTALA, they amended the Constitution to allow them to regulate this, something that had never been regulated before. You don't get to create the market distortion and say, oh, it's an emergency, we need new powers to fix it. The other necessary and proper uh, case that anybody who's following this needs to, f to, to be familiar with is the case of United States versus Com Comstock decided last May. Um, it is very interesting in the way the opinion comes down. It is a case involving whether the federal government has the power to have a civil commitment program for sexually violent predators. I won't get into all the ins and outs other than to note that there is a five-member majority. Uh, Justice Roberts joining Breyer, uh, Stevens, Sotomayor, and who am I leaving out? Ginsburg, thank you. Um, and there's part of the opinion where Breyer um, cites notes that all Congress needs is a rational reason. But the opinion doesn't stop there. It goes on and says the reason that you can uphold under the necessary and proper clause this particular congressional power is it passes a five, well, it considers five factors. Virginia has referred to this as the five factor test. Generally, when a court says these are the five factors that lead to our decision, I consider that a five factor test. Um, the, uh, Justice Department accused us of making up the test. We then referred them to Justice Thomas's dissent, the same case where he refers to the five-factor test of the majority. If we made it up, we didn't make it up. We're plagiarizing him. Um, and at least three of the five factors are deeply historical. Has this ever been done before? Does it respect the proper role of the states in our federal system? Are the links between the means chosen and enumerated power to attenuate it? And that was Randy's point. It's one thing to say it was necessary to regulate Mr. Filburn's wheat production to enforce a regulation of commerce. But this is fundamentally changing the commerce power. This isn't implementing it. This is changing it. It's saying it's not just regulating commerce. It's the ability to force people to engage in commerce so you th can then regulate them. Uh, there were concurrences by Alito and Kennedy in the case that noted that because of the deeply historical nature of holding federal prisoners dating back to the very first Congress passing laws regarding the, ca the care and holding of federal prisoners, it passed muster. Justice Thomas and Scalia dissented, saying there's no enumerated power at the end of this story, and therefore you lose. You, you know, kind of back to the schoolhouse rock thing. You know, the federal government is one of limited enumerated powers. Uh, what is particularly interesting, given Professor Barnett's comments, is that both opinions cite Scalia's concurrence in Raich. Breyer cites it for the proposition that uh, essentially Congress can do anything. They could even reach non-economic. Uh, lo local, non-economic, local activity, purely local activity. And this is the opinion that uh, Professor Barnett referred to where there are the 42 references to activity. 
the interesting thing is the dissent by, written by Justice Thomas says that's not what that means. You've gone off the reservation here. You don't understand it. It's a very limited principle. And there are still limits. That does not eradicate all limits. So who's right about what Scalia meant, Breyer or Thomas? Well, Scalia joined Thomas's opinion, so I'm going with Thomas on that one. Um, the taxing power argument. Um, this is one that, uh, that popped up in the Law Professoriate, the blogs. We were going to get blown out of the water on the taxing power argument. We had no chance. Congress has broad taxing authority. It can do what it wants. As long as the government's getting a check from somebody, they can do whatever they want. As uh, Professor Barnett pointed out, not only did we win this, not only did they win it in Florida, everybody who has argued against the federal government's taxing power argument has won. Not a single federal judge, even the ones upholding the mandate and penalty as a valid exercise of the commerce power, have found it. And there are just several reasons why this is so, and for, for congressional staffers, uh, some of them are very important. The first, and for, first, the act actually calls it a penalty and not a tax. Once again, our friends in law enforcement would call this a clue. Um, and that's really important in the terms of this act, because this act does impose taxes in other places, from cattle, quote, Cadillac health insurance plans, to tanning booths, to plastic surgery equipment. And it says taxes. And so it's clear that Congress thought it was doing something different, or at least if, we, if the words chosen indicate intent, thought they were doing something different. And of course, at the time this was going through, members of Congress said it wasn't a, they weren't raising taxes. And very famously, on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, President Obama got very upset when Stephanopoulos says, you're, you're violating your pledge not to raise taxes, and puts up the dictionary definition of tax, not a legal dictionary, and that becomes important in a minute. And I said, that's just crazy that you had to resort to a, a dictionary. That's a trick. You know, it's not a tax. We all know it's not a tax. Well, he was right. It's not a tax. The second thing is, that although it's not always determinative what Congress calls something, the court will actually look to see what it actually does and what it is, there is a legal distinction between penalties and taxes. They are very different things. The United States Supreme Court in 1931 and again in 1996 noted that the words tax and the word penalty, quote, are not interchangeable one for the other. No mere exercise of the art of lexicography can alter the essential nature of an act or a thing. And if an exaction be clearly a penalty, it cannot be converted into tax by the simple expedient of calling it such. That the exaction here in question is not a true tax, but a penalty involving the idea of punishment for infraction of the law is settled. So that's what a penalty is. The government tells you to go do something and says, if you don't, you have to pay us money. Well, let's look at the penalty here. You will go buy insurance or you will cut us a check for $695. Those are your options. At one point in the district court, they argued, no, 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 no. Penalties are only for unlawful acts. And so we actually broke out Black's Law Dictionary, resorting to our favorite dictionary trick again, and noted that unlawful means violation of, well, the law, whether civil or criminal. There are many white there are many corporations that have paid civil fines to the federal government over the years for, quote, unlawful acts that it would be very surprised to know that the federal government, the Justice Department now believes they shouldn't have paid them. It wasn't unlawful. Those were just taxes. No. And fundamentally, this is why it loses. Now, you'll also hear the argument, but the penalty after, you know, it was codified in Papaka, it goes into the Internal Revenue Code, Chapter Title 26 of the U.S. Code. So it must be a tax. Except the Internal Revenue Code actually has a provision that deals with this exact question. For those of you who are really bored someday, look at 26 U.S.C. 7806B. No inference, implication, or presumption of legislative construction shall be drawn 
or made by reason of the location or grouping of any particular section or provision of this title, as the United States Supreme Court said in 1996 in the reorganized CFNI fabricators case. That means because it's in the tax code doesn't mean it's a tax. It still has to meet the definition of a tax. So ultimately, even if it were a tax, it would lose its tax, even if they had called it a tax, it would lose its taxing quality because it is imposed for punishment, for failure to do an act. And Supreme Court case law dating back 100 years make clear that if that's the case, you need an enumerated power. If you're penalizing somebody for something they did or for, something, for not doing something you ordered them to do, you need an enumerated power. And therefore, the tax argument ultimately collapses back in to the Commerce Clause argument. Yes, ma'am. I'm not one either. The examples that people throw at us in the Justice Department says, well, how about the Social Security tax? How is this different than that? And of course, the difference is there is something of value. There's an accession to wealth. I went to work. I, met, I engaged in a voluntary activity. Um, the estate tax is, is the other favorite example. They say, how about, how, about, how, about, how, about, how about the estate tax? But in Knowlton versus Moore in 1898, the United States Supreme Court said that the estate tax does not, t what it is taxing, it is an excise, it is a duty on the transfer of property. It, uh, once again, a voluntary transaction, much like you just said, an accession. Well, voluntary for the person who receives it, and that's the person who pays the tax. They can go, don't want it, and guess what? They don't have to pay it. Uh, with this penalty, you can say, don't want it, still have to pay it. Uh, This is the only one we're involved in. I'll, I'll go ahead and guess the next question. The why. Well, and, and actually, it's a little, little different. Just, just assuming for a moment that, that you win your suit and the other states fail in theirs, what, what is ultimately the result there? Is the, is the, the lawyer in Virginia was just bad. No, just well, kidding. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of a given. I would have made that joke a lot with a lot more vigor if he hadn't signed on in Florida. <laughs> Well, I'll talk about the severance question a little bit in a minute, but the answer is both the Florida suit and the Virginia suit argue that whatever our various injuries to get us into court to, to survive standing, our argument is that the, the act is that the mandate and penalty are such a of central relevance to the act that there is no conceivable way that Congress would have passed them with would have passed the bill without it, and therefore the whole whole bill fails, and so that would apply to everyone everywhere. Now, if by some weird set of happenstance, Virginia ended up in your hypothetical having one and no one else did, I'd be okay with that short term. <laughs> but I would prefer that the whole law be stricken because I do believe it's unconstitutional. And we'll talk a little bit about severance in a minute. The other argument that the, the Justice Department is advancing as to why this is unique is that healthcare is just a really, really big problem. Um, and that's not a constitutional argument. Um, and in fact, it's an argument that has, often, that has been tried on multiple occasions um, in some of the bigger cases involving conflicts of state 
federal power. A New York versus United States, which dealt with taking title to radioactive waste. And the court commented that, you know, Congress asserts that this is a really big problem. And our response to that on the constitutionality question is, okay. Um, and in fact, once again, uh, this past June in uh, Free Enterprise Fund versus the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, uh, the Supreme Court noted, calls to abandon constitutional protections in light of the error's perceived necessity are not unusual, nor is the argument from bureaucratic expertise limited only to the field of accounting. The failures of accounting regulation may be a, quote, pressing national problem, close quote, but a judiciary that licensed extra constitutional government with each issue of comparable gravity would in the long run be far worse. In short, you don't get to say this is a really big problem. That may be true, but as a constitutional matter, it's irrelevant. The remedy is the severance question, and since I've already gotten a question on that, and Professor Barnett and I managed to go over time, why don't we just go to the questions and answers now? 